Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I feel like I'm Tucker Carlson. Good evening. Welcome to Word of Life midweek service on this wonderful, wonderful evening. We are talking about tonight some things we've been wrestling with in the last few times. It's things that's been going over in my spirit. Um, and so we're going to continue on that. Just be in agreement with me and, and be just utter a prayer right now for God would give me utterance in the spirit that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone that believe that you can say amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, let's start. Oh, we, we, we had a conversation with Mark Council today, and um, he asked Patrice to rally the troops, to, and he's going to send, or he did send to Pastor Carolyn a kind of uh, prototype letter that we can send to the Concord Monitor. Is that it, right? Yes. And uh, so, a letter to the editor. And so we don't want to copy it exactly, but you want to just kind of bring out certain points in there concerning this casino and uh, what it's going to do to the culture of the city of Concord and, um, and so forth. And uh, we're just trying to get a lot of people involved in this thing. We want to make some noise. We want to get some attention to this thing, stir up more people. It's not a good thing. Anyway, but now back to the... Back to the Bible, uh, in Jesus' name. So let's, we, you know, we, there were things in my spirit uh, the past few months that, uh, like, for the, the thing about, and I was, sometimes things will get in there, and I'm trying to get them out and uh, communicate them. And uh, I was also prompted to, uh, to, uh, let me see here. Um, looking for the scripture, uh, Matthew 10, verse 40, Matthew 10, verse 40. Let's go over there, uh, and just kind of bring something out here. Matthew 10, verse 40, uh, <clears throat> uh, just something here we have to keep in mind and see there are things I have to tell you, not that it's for my sake, but it's for your sake. And uh, see, the when there's a call of God on a person, there, there, uh, and I'll and I'll read some of this for you. It says here in Matthew uh, ten verse forty. Hunter, remember Luke four, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter ten, verse forty, and. Uh, See, this is exactly, it's just, it kind of goes along with the character of God. When Jesus uh, was teaching in parables, he was actually protecting those people. I don't know if that's going to work. I'm going to get a more firmer hardcover. And, uh, and so in Matthew 10, verse 40, he says this. He says, he that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Now remember that. He that receiveth you, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, he that receiveth you, receiveth me. And sometimes, uh, especially people that have been around, oh, sometimes they have a tendency to uh, be careless. Uh, remember I was talking about um, the, the sin of familiarity? Uh, see, this is not just coincidental that these things come up. It's the Spirit of God bringing them up in my spirit. And, uh, and I believe Him and you know, go through Scripture and look into stuff and believe God for others to be able to bring it out, communicate it to you to where... Uh, see, all, we're all responsible for what we've been shown, um, the call of God on our lives. And uh, see, all of us have to answer and uh, it's not just the congregation that has to be submitted. I have to be submitted. I'm submitted to leaders. Um, you know, Brother Copeland, one of them, you know, he's, he's the main guy that I'm submitted to. Uh, with Brother Hagen, but he's now in heaven. But now Brother Copeland has become my uh, uh, spiritual father. So, um, 
in uh, so reading the scripture again Matthew 10 verse 40 it says he that receiveth you receiveth me and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me now I tried to put a title on this thing and I'm you know it's going to come out the way it's going to come out I don't know if, how well it'll fit with the title but Let's look over to, uh, let's look over here to uh, the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is, uh, it's uh, some stuff that goes on here. And, you know, everybody is going to be challenged with the sin of uh, familiarity. Everybody. But if you can understand that... Uh, See, I have to be very careful myself. You know, I've I've been allowed access into some people's lives over the years, and uh, we did things together. You know, like I tell I tell people that come into the church. You know, I've had people come in the church. One I remember one guy specifically said, "I want to be your best friend." See, that just put a red flag up. I'm not here to be your friend, and don't misunderstand that. I will be friendly. We all walk in love, but God didn't send me here to be your friend. God sent me to be your pastor. And see, the pastor gift that's in me, that's going to be more valuable to you than me trying to be your friend. That, that's really not worth a whole lot. But the pastoral gift that's in me and what, who I've sat under and they've imparted things in my, my life, my spirit, that's the thing that holds the greatest value to you. And to all those that will honor that and respect that. And see, that's why you have to not look at me. You have to look at me as a gift from God, me and Carolyn. We're, we're gift. And it's not that we put that on us. That's what God put us on us. And I wanted you to see that. He that receiveth you receiveth me, Jesus said. See, he sent us out. That's why it's so important to be sent out by him. People have settled for so less of trying to get somebody on the internet just to put a paper on them. And, and there's, no, there's nothing there to back it up. God's not obligated to back that up. He initiates those things. When you're faithful, you know, when you're faithful and you're, you're consistent and you're faithful over time, God's going God's gonna to honor you. God's going to pick you out and send you where he wants you to be. And you may just be in the church the rest of your life, working in the church. There's nothing wrong with that. The secret is you want to be, you want to be willing and obedient. See, it says there, if you be willing and obedient, Isaiah, I believe, says this, if you be willing and obedient, you, you'll eat the good of the land. See, that's the key. It's not so much the assignment it's the it's it's so much as the faithfulness to the assignment and the obedience to it it's going to differ from everybody else you're not all going to be called the same thing but but you know up here in northern new england we we there's a lack in good churches and uh so you may see a more of a uh focus on that from the kingdom of god now uh let's look at uh uh Look, we see what Luke chapter four, and it says in verse sixteen, it says, "And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read." Now, just try to imagine that. See, he lived there until he was thirty years of age. And then he went down to the River Jordan, and that's where he met John the Baptist, and that's where he was baptized, and the Holy Ghost descended on him and anointed him. You read Acts 10, 38, that's where it's going to tell you what happened there, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That's when Jesus was anointed for ministry. That's why his ministry didn't start till he was 30 years of age. And after he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, he was Jesus all of his life, but he, he was not anointed until John the Baptist took him and they went and met each other and John put him under the water and the Holy Ghost descended on him and the Father God spoke, this is my beloved son. And it was in an audible voice and a lot of people thought it thundered. 
So, anyway, so um, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and his custom was was to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him a book, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. <clears throat> now they were reading this Torah portion. That's what this is called, the Torah portion. And this is from the book of Isaiah. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captive, captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And with one translation says, to preach the free favors of God profusely abounding. That's the year of Jubilee. That is what he's talking about right there. And that, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them were on him. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears this day? This is coming to pass right in front of your face is what he's talking about. And all bore him witness and wondered at the graciousness words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Right there reveals there is a familiarity going on here. Isn't this Joseph's boy? Who does he think he is? And, uh, and he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me, This proverb, Physician, heal thyself. And whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet, now listen to this, he's continuing on the familiarity thing. No prophet is acceptable in his own country, but I tell you, truth, tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, three and a half years. See, Elijah had prayed, and the, the heavens were shut up for three and a half years. And when, great, and, and, and when great famine was throughout the land, that's from three and a half years of no rain caused a famine. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto the Sarepta, a city of Sidon, or Zidon. It was the Phoenician city. It was up the coast. And God did not send him to a city um, that was on the northern edge of Israel up there. And uh, it was Phoenician. And he said he did not send him, but there. And... Uh, he said, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save Sarepta, a city of Sidon, S-I-D-O-N, or Z-I-D-O-N, um, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elijah, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, a Syrian. He's not an Israelite either. See, he's re revealing... There, there was a familiarity with, with the Israelites to these prophets. They weren't ready to receive from them. They were too familiar with them. So God didn't send them to them. He sent them to people that would honor them. And that's exactly what God will do. If people in an area that God sends a man or a woman of God to that area, and they don't honor them. Now, in our situation, our church... Majority of the people in that congregation honors the gift in Carolyn and I. But sometimes people get lack and lazy and they, get, they don't get in the word themselves. They don't do any personal study. They live on whenever they come to church and they don't come to church much. See, in these last days, we're warned. We're warned. Go over real quickly over to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Now you got to receive the word of God with meekness in, in order for it to have an effect on you. You receive the word of God with meekness. That means 
humility. You're teachable. And if you got it just to make the adjustment right now, you do it. See, it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about how God is doing his kingdom. Who are we to tell God who to pick? See, when you answer the call of God and you place yourself in his hands and you study and put yourself in the places where, like where we have done, you know, de dedicated my, my life. <laughs> when I heard it, when I heard how to do it, I, my ears picked it up. There's that, see, there's that other thing that's been going on in my spirit. It's called the spirit of truth. And I, I picked that up when I heard it. I picked that up when I heard it. You know, uh, <clears throat> um, now we're heading over to, I told you to turn over to, uh, uh, where was that I told you to turn over? Um, a, uh, oh, well, we're going to find, we're going to remember what that is, but while you, while we do, look at John 18, 37, won't you? We're just going to make a little hash here. Uh, John 18, 37, this is John. Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews, yeah, that's right. Hebrews 10, <clears throat> we'll come back to this one, Hebrews 10. We're over there, 10, 1025, 1025, it says, not forsaking, or let's start up a little bit. He says, <clears throat> uh, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Holding fast to the profession of your faith is holding fast to the deep and the uh, the, the uh, foundational things that you believe. Those are foundational things about the blood of Jesus, how he set you free. He that the son sets free is free indeed. The faith of Jesus, the impartation of the faith of God, the spirit of God, all these foundational things, they we are to hold fast our confession with them. Hallelujah. Now, and, and it says, and then verse 23, he says, uh, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he that is faithful, he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Consider one another. People, friends that you know, have known over the years that are maybe backed away from the things of God. It says, consider, let us consider one another to provoke Provoke means to strongly encourage uh, unto love and to good works. Not, verse 25 here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Exhorting, strong encouragement one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching. We can see the day approaching. My goodness, what's going on in the world? The effects of the uh, pandemic. What's that done to the world? What's that done to communities? What's that done to our nation? What's that done to our medical field, our medical institution? What's that done to our, our media? What's that done to our military? What's that done to, uh, you know, everything? Our police, our, you know, and our border. Our, our, our borders are not secure. We, we've got fentanyl everywhere. And you can just get within certain feet and, and die of fentanyl. Hallelujah. But so he says, um, hallelujah. So now look at John 8, 37. Well, I wanted to show you this. Now remember... There's this spirit of truth. There's this importance of knowing the word of God. You can't be ignorant of the word of God. You have to know it. The devil will know if you know it or don't. And if you don't know it, you're, you're a target. And you're trying to live for God and you don't study. You're a target. He'll pick you out. You're like that, like a lame antelope amongst the herd there, like in Africa, you've seen it where the, the, the female lions are the ones that do the hunting. And you'll see them 
they'll go around and looking for the ones that are barely hanging on the pack. You know, they're, they're, they're lagging back. They'll separate them, you know, uh, divide and conquer. You separate them, get them outside of the pack, and they'll go after them. He'll go after, he'll go after you. That's why you have to stay in the pack. You have to come and, uh, uh, you know, you have to, see, when you, when I'm talking about the legitimate ones, the legitimate ones that have legitimately got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, are following the things of God. And God opening your eyes and bringing and leading you to a pastor, a man of God, and you recognize that and you, you begin to get faithful in there. You begin to serve him in that, that capacity, Wh whoever it is. Um, and I'm talking to people that have been called, most of you, if not all of you, have been called to Carolyn and I. And, uh, and m many and the majority of, of you all are faithfully serving God this way. But you can't allow yourself to get lack in this thing. Lax. In these last days, that's the key. That's one of the things the enemy tries to do is to get you overconfident, get you thinking you don't need to do certain things anymore. You're doing enough of them or stuff like that. You're, you know, not, not, you know, uh, you're letting go of some revelation you've had. In Hebrews chapter two, verse one, it talks about, we are not to let these things slip. Have prior revelations. If you don't, if you don't go over them regularly, and renew your mind to them again, they can slip in your life. That's why there might have been a time in your life that you were right on target with faith and studying faith and healing, and you saw God was able to do stuff. You were able to uh, get your faith into a place that you could receive from him. That's what that's all about. You're not trying to convince God to heal you. You're, getting, you're, you're studying the word and convincing yourself as Abraham, it was said about Abraham, he staggered not at the promises of God because of unbelief. He didn't stagger. He was keeping that in front of him. That's why God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. So he had to call himself that all the time. And he began to have success in his life. But you look at Romans chapter 4, and it'll tell you about Abraham. He staggered not at the promises of God. He was uh, fully... Uh, convinced, persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to deliver on that. Hallelujah. And so, and, and in John 18, verse 37, it says, thou sayest that I am a king. This is Jesus talking to Pilate. Thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end, I was born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. That's a tremendous scripture. It's, it's when you, those of us, see, he says, I was, to this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth Everyone that's born of the truth, see, we're all born of the same word and of the same spirit. If you're born of Jesus, if you're born again, legitimately born again, uh, John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he'll not see the kingdom of God. And, uh, and see, you come into the kingdom by being born again. Your inner man is created, recreated. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new and all things are of God. That experience has recreated your inner man. And so you're born of the spirit. Now you're born of the truth. The, my word is truth, Jesus says. I'm the, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He, he, we're born of him. We have his DNA in us. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word was made flesh. So, and we heard that word. 1 Peter uh, 1 23 it says, we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God, word, living word of God. And, and that's what we're born. That's why we, we bear witness to the truth. We, we recognize a lie and see if you follow the wrong spirit, you will have a tendency to get into a place. Um, look at over here. <laughs> 
Look it over here in 2 Thessalonians. This helping anybody? I don't know about it's helping you, but it's helping me. See, see it helps me understand what, what's been going on over in, inside of me, you know, over the last uh, month and a half, two months. And uh, in, sec, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, it's uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You, you can tell it because it doesn't say. Look at verse 11. It says, and, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, let's go back and look at this in, in beginning in the beginning of the chapter. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, this, this uh, tells us right here of the rapture of the church. It says, Now I beg you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. We're going to be gathering together up in the, in the clouds. It says that you not be soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit or by word nor letter as from us or as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now, underline that little phrase there. Underline that phrase. Excuse me. Let no man deceive you. Verse 3, chapter 2, Second Thess Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not that for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first um, and that man of sin be revealed in the son of perdition now underline that word falling those two words falling away I, I don't know what your bible says there but it'll say something to that expect um, in the Weiss translation i believe is the best translation of that and it brings out the real meaning of what he's talking about it says in the Weiss translation, it says, that's, that's by the way, that's W-U-E-S-T. And, uh, um, and he says that that day shall not come, talking about the catching away of the church. That day shall not come, un no, that's, it's not the catching away of the church. Uh, I'm in chapter... I'm in 2 Thessalonians. The rapture is first, always remember, the rapture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Here I'm in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's talking about the second coming. And I want you to see this. Uh, he said, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, that second coming of, the, of Christ, um, let no man deceive you by any any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That falling away is the Greek word. Uh, um, let me just tell you what Weiss translation, how it translates it. It translates it a departure. See, that shows you what's going on right there is the catching away of the church. See, that day cannot come except uh, the catching away of the church uh, happen. The man of sin cannot be revealed until the catching away of the church is taken place. See, we're the church. The legitimate born-again church is what's holding back uh, the, the uh, Antichrist. And that man cannot be revealed until there comes a departure of the church. That's what he's talking about, the departure of the church. God takes the church out, and uh, it opens the door for the enemy to bring his, uh, his man forward. He, he, he reveals the Antichrist. And, uh, and it goes on, it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, he had been with them. This Thessalonian, this book of Thessalonians, this letter, First and Second Thessalonians, was the first epistle written to the church. 
And it was because a teacher came by and, and told them that the rapture had already happened. They, they had missed it. And uh, they was much concerned. You can just imagine for people, they didn't have the Bible written. They didn't have the word of God in their face. They couldn't look at it. Like we have the luxury of having the word. We have copies of the word, multiple copies. Uh, he said, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withhold, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He says, now you know, you remember what I told you, you know what holds him back. And it was the church. He says, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth, that letteth, if you're a tennis player, you, you, you'll re recognize that word letteth, when you take a first serve and it hits the net and goes over into the other side, get, it still stays in bounds. That's called a let, L-E-T. That's the same word here. It means a hindrance. It's been hindered. And uh, <clears throat> the net hindered it. It says, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Um, the church is one he's talking about. He's hindering. That we are the authority on the planet. We're, we're part of Jesus' body. He's going to call us home. That will open a door. That will allow Satan to bring his man in, into being. <clears throat> so he says here, And then shall the wicked ones, it's right in, 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 right in line in here, verse 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall the wicked be revealed. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Hallelujah. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. See, this is why we're born of the truth and we will recognize things. Now, we're going to be taken out of the way by this time. That's why it says we... Uh, he, who is hindering going to be taken out of the way. It says, and with all deceivableness, verse 10, and with all deceivableness and un of right unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. That's what we are doing. We are doing, all last summer we focused on it, winning the lost, winning the lost, preaching the truth of the, of the gospel. And so, and they that don't respond the right way to the gospel are going to open themselves up. And uh, they, it says right there, and verse 10, it says, And with all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they shall believe a lie. We saw bits and pieces of this during the pandemic when truth came out about the vaccines. And don't ever get in my face and say, I'm talking whoever other than the church, our church watching, I'm talking to others that may be getting hit. Don't ever talk to me about talking about the vaccines. The vaccines were deliberately done the way they were done. That's not an accident. Our medical professionals know what they're doing. There are two great stories about vaccines. You know the famous uh, vaccine there for polio? There were tremendous men that studied and endured things and brought together certain vaccines that were a great blessing to humanity. But over the years now, uh, evil men have got in positions. And this is all was intended. You know, I've had a person that I respect very much, but she was kind of downplaying it. You can't downplay in this. This, see, we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Yeah. We got to warn our brother and sister about this. You, you leave the vaccines alone. You don't need the vaccines. Hallelujah. Ivermectin and uh, hydroxychloroquine will help you with anything in, in this concerning this. 
Okay, let's continue. It says, for with this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. They should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, and belief of the truth. You heard the truth and you reacted to it in a positive way. You believed it. You received it. The truth of Jesus and what he came to do and how he died on the cross and shed his blood for our remission of sins. We believed it. We received it. And we were instantly born again in the family. See, God knows who's going to respond to that thing. He knows. That's why he's watched over many of you and saved you and pulled your little backside out of all kinds of situations that would have killed many other people. But see, he knows the end from the beginning. Don't kid yourself. There's people that never were, you know, I, I don't make the rules and God does what he does, but, uh, but there's things I know. I, I know I was saved a number of times in my lifetime from death. I, I didn't know exactly what it was. I remember being out with a buddy of mine on a lake with a boat and I did not have a good feeling about it. In my spirit, I, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know, and uh, I, I really didn't do a lot. I was, you know, going to work on a solemn, uh, 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 is it slalom, skiing one, on one ski, single ski, single ski. And, uh, and I was pretty good at it, but I just I didn't. I had a real uh, caution in my spirit. I, I had a troubling in my spirit, so I never did it. And uh, and this is back when I was in college. So God has watched over all of us because he knew we were going to respond to the gospel and people were praying for us. So let's go over here. It says, uh, now, um, in, in Matthew chapter 22, so we understand where the truth, the spirit of truth, how it is, a, how it is, how has it affected our life after we've been born again, that we, we are, we drawn to it. And you'll recognize it when you hear it. That's why you stayed out of certain areas and didn't go certain ways because that spirit of truth was working on you. And uh, in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 22, this is something that Jesus had to get involved with here. Jesus answered in verse, Matthew 22, verse 29. And Jesus answered and said unto them, he said, uh, let me just see if I want to start there or start up a little bit. Well, you'll get the picture. Here's in, in verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do error, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He was talking about, there was talk about if, if there's going to be marriage in heaven. But no matter what it is, Jesus brought out the fact that they did not know the scripture on this. And so they were in error. And see, this is about, any, anybody can, you know, move off the track in some things because they don't know the scripture. I got family of mine that I was talking to the other day. And, uh, and she, you know, she just constantly wants to fuss and argue with me uh, about things. And, uh, you know, I have forgotten more than she knows. I've been in this for 40 years. She hasn't been in it hardly at all. She just goes to her church. And, uh, and she's, every time I talk to her, she's trying to get me in a fuss or trying to fuss with me about what I believe. So I just, just try to do my best to stay out of any kind of argument. She asked me one time, you know, she goes, Thomas, you mean to tell me you don't believe that Peter was our first Pope? And I said, that's right. <laughs> anyway, I love her, but Peter wasn't our first Pope, my friend. Uh, the Catholic Church didn't start till the fourth century with Constantine. You know, people will try to tell you stuff, but that's the truth of the matter. Um, Rome had a church, and that wasn't the Catholic Church. The book, the Epistle of Rome, that was not the Catholic Church. That was one of the early churches. Remember, Catholic Church started with Constantine. Go ahead and look up, see what years he was in, in there. But anyway, so we're going to uh, do communion now. I... Uh, 
Now, before we do, I'm going to just read a couple of scriptures here. In Psalm 103, verse 20, the importance of the word of God. Jesus said, you do err not knowing the word of God. You don't know it. And, and, and the Bible says, if you're in the wrong crowd and doing the, you're, not, you're not yielding to the right thing, God's going to give those people strong delusions. They, that's the kind of people, the people that refuse God, refuse the truth, did not believe the love of the truth. That's what Second Thessalonians says right there. They not, did not believe the love of the truth. And so God just gave them over. They let them get, get be consumed by this uh, wrong spirit. But if you are you you embrace the truth, you you gravitate towards it, and He keeps you in it. And in, if you go over here to uh, uh, Isaiah fifty-five, look at over Isaiah fifty-five, and we'll close with this one. Uh, and going to we're going to have communion together, and uh, I, I believe in God. And see, so you have to constantly believe God and and declare and, and uh, <clears throat> proclaim of healings in as we take communion tonight we're going to believe god for healings and deliverances in the name of jesus now as isaiah 55 it says for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways saith the lord now if he stopped right there you know then we realize that he's he's way up there and we're down here but he didn't stop right there he continues and he shows how we can get his thoughts into our mind and not just settle for our earthly thoughts. No, he's telling us and he's actually commending us to do this. Take his thoughts and put them in our minds and then we'll be able to think like him. Hallelujah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Like I said, if he stopped right there, we knew we wouldn't have any opportunity to think like God. But he didn't stop. Verse 10. For as the rain, for as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread for the eater. Notice the seed for the sower is future. And bread for the eating is now. He tells you, he, he, you take his thoughts and put them in your head. That will give you the ammo. It will give you the necessary uh, things that you need to bring and to bring all your needs to him to meet all your needs. Now it goes on in verse 11. So shall my word be. See, he says the rain, the snow. And he said, just like that is how my word's going to be. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It goes forth out of his mouth, out of a prophet, out of a pastor, out of a teacher that's ministering the word of God. That word's going out of his mouth, from his spirit, out of his mouth. And if you'll catch it, that will, that will begin to work in your life. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of your, my mouth. It, it, it shall not return unto me void. It's not going to return unto me empty. He says, but it shall accomplish that which I please. That word itself will accomplish the will of God. It says, which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And it goes on and talks about other things right there, but see, that's the key. It's, it's listening to the word of God coming out of the spirit of man or spirit of God. See, we are carrying this treasure in earthen vessels. And that treasure is the Holy Ghost. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That treasure's in there. And we put the word of God inside there. And the word of God and the spirit of God begin to move on itself and it begins to, when it comes out in teaching, anointed teaching and preaching, and you grab it with the spirit of listening, you're hearing that spiritual hearing. You grab it and you bring it forth to bud. It comes to life in you. And you begin to say it out of your mouth. It begins to develop in you. It begins to, to bring out the fruit of the spirit in your life. 
See, this is how you mature and grow in the things of God. Hallelujah. You honor what God honors. You honor what God sent. And you honor the same thing. Don't get familiar with it. Keep yourself at a distance. Honor it. And like I said, you know, people come in to want to be friends. That's not the right attitude. But if you want to be work with us, you get you hook up with us. You work with us. You put your gifts and talents in in in, in to work into this ministry. That's how you get to be around people. I was, you know, I God rewarded me. We agreed to have a three-week revival. I agreed three nights, and it went three weeks. And God blessed me. During, during that time, I got a phone call from a gentleman that was producing a movie, a Western movie. And God knew that that was something in my heart. And so, you know, he called us up. And the guy that was producing the movie had no idea I had any experience in that. I never told him. But he just knew by the Spirit of God to give me a call. Because I told him, if you ever need anything, give me a call. And I did. And so God put us together. We had a great time. I, that's where I got to know Brother Copeland. I got to know Jesse Duplantis, Jerry Savell, and other men of God in that place. They were all involved with that thing. And uh, But see, I didn't, you know, mistreat that. I didn't uh, take that for granted. I honored them. And it was just a great experience to sit around and talk to those guys around the campfire and, uh, and all kinds of things we did together. We did it for a whole month, and, uh, but it was a great experience. God did that and blessed me. But see, you always have to learn how to behave around those ministry gifts. You, you don't idolize them. You honor them. And, uh, and anyway, uh, we're, we're going to have communion now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. So I'm believing God and praying that, uh, that you're getting what God wants you to get and receiving all that he has for you. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. There it is. <clears throat> I have some notes in my phone that I have wrote down over different times and stuff of me studying about the communion table. And uh, see, in the book of... Uh, Psalms, Psalms 105, verse 39, it says, um, it's verse 37, and he brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. And this story about how the Hebrews came out of Egypt. And before they were able to come, God had them uh, celebrate the Passover meal. And every house was to take a lamb, according to the size of the household. And they were to take the lamb, and they were to cook it by fire, and eat it with bitter herbs and all these things. And they took the blood and sprinkled it on the doorposts of their homes. And it would when the death angel came, it would see that blood and it'd have to pass over the blood. It, it couldn't cross and uh, the whole family would, would be saved and it, everybody was healed. It, it says it in the King James that there was not one feeble one among them. And he's depicting out that everybody had any kind of hitch or battle with anything. They were all healed. When they ate the Passover meal, they were healed. And they were working off the shadow. They were working off the actual animal of a lamb, a lamb, the blood of a lamb. We are not operating off that. When Jesus sat down with the disciples on the, the night before he was crucified, he took the bread, he broke it and said, and it was what we, they called the Last Supper. And he took that bread and he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And so when they did that, 
you know, God was able to do whatever he needed to do, but also it smoked out people. It smoked Judas out. And it also, you know, almost got Peter out. But Jesus warned Peter. See, the difference of Judas and Peter is that Peter had put himself in a position where God was watching over him. <laughs> Judas had pretty much painted himself in a corner, and he, he was the problem of his own demise. He sold himself out. He sold Jesus out. Peter didn't go that far. See, Jesus warned him, and he said, he told him, he said, Satan desires you to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And see, Peter is the one that sowed into Jesus' ministry. Uh, Judas was the one that stole from his ministry. He was stealing out of the bag. See, two different guys doing two different things. Sowing into Jesus' ministry brought protection around him. Stealing from him set him up for total demise. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to him saying, this is my body. So we're going to take the cracker and we take it in the name of Jesus. It says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also, Jesus took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you, Luke 22, verse 19 through 20. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over, Psalm 23, verse 5. Psalm 23, verse 5 tells us that right in the presence of our enemies, right in the midst of our symptoms, pains, and lack, God prepares a table, the communion before us. So, Let's come boldly today to the Lord's table and receive afresh his health, strength, and wholeness of life. Thank you, Father God. This covenant meal we receive in the name of Jesus. We take this and say, Lord Jesus, I receive my total wholeness, health, shalom, shalom, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I receive from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and every part of me. In the name of Jesus, Father, I receive the fullness of ministry that you have chosen for me to walk in. I receive that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I'll stand and, and uh, be faithful in whatever you called me to stand in, what office you called me to stand in. I'll, I'll do it faithfully, Lord. I thank you. In the precious name of Jesus. Likewise, he took the cup. Hallelujah. For the remission of sins, the total <laughs> annihilation of any wrongdoing. Hallelujah. And the total remake making up a new operating system. We've been born again in the name of Jesus. All of our sins are under the blood. They're gone as far as the east is from the west. No wrongdoing in Jesus' name. And we receive it. And we thank you, Father, for it in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We, we thank God for all of you out there. And, and we, we just agree with you that you will rest well tonight. You'll sleep well. And let God minister life and health to you as you sleep tonight. And we'll, be, we'll rise and be refreshed. And, uh, and we'll be empowered to face the day ahead. This is the day that we're dealing with today. This is the day the Lord has made. But we look forward by faith to tomorrow in Jesus' name. Now the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face toward you 
and give you peace. Shalom, shalom, in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said amen to that. Hallelujah. Amen. Good night. Thank you again for returning, for being a part of us. Amen.